Good morning, church. What a blessing and pleasure it is to be here with you this morning. Um, I was out there about 30, 45 minutes ago outside, and it is beautiful outside right now. God is good. And all the time... Amen. Uh, people kind of did it in here. The praise team did it while they were uh, here with me. But I pray that you were able to say all the time, and God is good at home. And for those of you that are uh, watching this by sitting on your porches or you have the window open nearby you, I'm going to admit I'm jealous. I'm jealous, but get to worship and celebrate at the same time uh, in togetherness uh, that God is good and that you are in the midst of God's creation and God's goodness as he blesses, as he blesses us and as he leads us um, to be a blessing in his kingdom. Our theme for this year, for 2020, is to have kingdom vision, to seek first his kingdom. And you got to hear that in our worship service this morning. You got to see it in the scripture that was shared and the prayers that were shared for communion and by Ben. And the truth as we seek first the kingdom of God is that even though we can enjoy great days and rejoice in days like today, we need to remember that God is good all the time. And what that means is that God joins us when we're rejoicing, and he also joins us when we're weeping. So for the families that are struggling the loss of loved ones from uh, recent uh, passings that we've had in our congregation, we're with you. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so we need to be in togetherness um, in that, and we can rejoice and weep at the same time because of how good God is. God joined us in his goodness, as Jason shared with us in the communion message, through Jesus, because God so loves us that Jesus came and became flesh like us, that we know that God weeps and when we weep. You see it in Jesus and the things that he does. And we also know that God rejoices during times that we should be rejoicing in his love and in his goodness in his creation. And we can join into that. This sermon this morning is from, it's really a two-part series. It began last week where we got to talking about, um, about the Sermon on the Mount and how Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount. And it's really important that we remember what went on as we talk about authentic faith, having real faith for real life. Because when Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount and he shares the Sermon on the Mount, he invites us in to a truth of reality that we can be a part of now. I know some people look at the Sermon on the Mount and say a lot of these things are unattainable until Jesus comes again, until we no longer sin any longer. And I'm going to argue that no, that's not what the Sermon on the Mount was all about. The Sermon on the Mount was an invitation into a transformed life where we can celebrate the goodness of God now, even as we may have mistakes every now and then because Jesus came to free us from those mistakes, from that sin, and from enslavement to death. And so last week we concluded with this idea that the Beatitudes are not about actions or behaviors that we should strive for in order to get a reward. Please catch that. We should be striving for these behaviors and attitudes. I, I completely agree that we should, but we don't do it for the reward. We do it because of the invitation of what we've been called to be transformed towards, to come into. So we are able to mourn and rejoice at the same time because God comforts those who mourn. And we're able to recognize the truth that God has been calling through Jesus an invitation to accept those who feel like they can't connect with him because they're spiritually poor, as well as those who have been a, a little bit too spiritually rich and have been missing that God's trying to connect with them. Maybe those that hunger and thirst for righteousness and they will be filled because Jesus invited them into a transformative life. So the, the Beatitudes are about the transformative nature of the kingdom of heaven for everyone, only through Jesus. This morning's message is about the Good Samaritan, but really, honestly, when you read the Gospels, the good news that the Gospel writers are sharing with us, it's wise to read the good news in large chunks. I know we have chapters and verses, and I know they're very useful for studying because I can tell you where to turn to in Scripture, and you'll be able to get there. Such as, if you do have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to be reading from verses number 25 through 37 this morning. But we've got to understand this truth. Luke 10, th this message about the parable of the Good Samaritan does not begin, the context does not begin here. It begins way back in chapter 8, verse 1. So what I want to encourage you is sometime this week, and by the way, Luke 8 through Luke 10, if you read 8, 9, and 10 of Luke, and you want to know who Jesus is and what he came on earth to do, 
you read those three chapters and you're gonna see what the whole mission of Jesus is all about because it's in those three chapters. Except for his death, burial, and resurrection, which by the way, he talks about in those chapters. It's all there. So I wanna encourage you to read all of it. But what we need to do is we need to look back at Luke chapter eight and what Jesus does there, what Luke shares with us. And it begins with parables. Jesus begins sharing good news as he invites people to seek his kingdom first by sharing parables. And then his disciples ask him for the reason of why he's sharing parables, because it seems some people are having a hard time understanding what the parables are really all about. And Jesus' parables are pretty simple. The ideas that, the, the story that he tells is really simple, but the ideas and the, the depth of truth that comes out of the parables is so deep that sometimes people miss it. And so Jesus has to tell them that I speak in parables for those that will hear will be able to hear and those who see will be able to see, but those who don't listen won't be able to get it. And he talks about that in Luke chapter 8. But then you continue on and you see Jesus calming the storm. You see Jesus healing people and casting out demons. You see Jesus sending out the 12 to the cities to go share the truth that there's good news, that it's the time of celebration because God in the flesh has come in Jesus. The Messiah is here. And then you see Jesus in Luke chapter 10 sending out the 72. He sends them out to all different cities and he tells them to go out and pray for the cities, to share good news and to heal and cast out demons. And they go out and do all of this really neat and powerful stuff. And when they come back, verse number 17 of Luke 10, it says, the 72 returned with joy, with rejoicing, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. But here's the deal. Remember, we're still in a series thinking about the Beatitudes and what the Beatitudes means for us. Watch Jesus' response here in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when they come back rejoicing, saying, look, even the demons are fleeing. He says, however, do not rejoice about the fact that the spirits submit to you. Jesus says to them that you didn't go out because you're going out to cast out demons. That's not the primary purpose. That's not the main point. Now, it happened because of the primary purpose, but that's not the main key thing. Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Instead, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Again, do you remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke chapter 8 through 10 are in in Luke's gospel. It's in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Luke separates ideas of the Sermon on the Mount out and puts narrative of Jesus's life in the midst as he's telling the Sermon on the Mount. And in the midst of it, we have his disciples going out and casting out demons and inviting people into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus reminds them that it's not about how awesome you were at your actions. Instead, it's about who you were that got your name written into the kingdom of heaven, into the, written in heaven because of who I am. Remember, they were only able to cast out demons because they were doing it in the name of Jesus. They were only able to heal the sick because that's what Jesus came to do. That's what Jesus gets up in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 when he opens up Isaiah and starts reading. He proclaims that this is the year of the Lord's favor to heal the sick, to free the captives, to bring sight to the blind. And so as we go towards the parable of the Good Samaritan, we begin to notice that Jesus is freeing the spiritual poor from the bondage that's in the world. And he's also gonna free those that think they're spiritually rich from their bondage, that they can all be invited into the kingdom of heaven and have their names written there. He continues on, and this is the context to begin the, um, the parable of the Good Samaritan, why Jesus tells it. Because Jesus has been with the disciples, the 72 have come back, and they've all been talking, they've all been sharing and rejoicing this good news, and other people must have come around and see what all the clamor, all the commotion was all about, and he comes back and shares this. And he says to them, he gets his disciples aside, and when they were alone, he turns to the disciples and says, blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they did not see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Jesus is essentially telling them that there's people that don't pay attention very well, that they're not seeking first the kingdom of heaven. Instead, they're seeking other kingdoms first. And more than likely, it's their own kingdoms. And so they're missing it. 
And so he begins to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan because people are missing it. And I think it's a really interesting parable to help us see the invitation that the, that the Sermon on the Mount begins with in the Beatitudes, that we all, the spiritually poor and the spiritually rich, those that think that they don't have it and those that think that they do, have been invited by God through Jesus to come in relationship and have their names written in heaven. Have a relationship with God. So, because Jesus tells parables, I think it's important, and remember, this whole thing is about that we need to listen, that we need to be aware and seek first the kingdom of heaven and listen. I think it would be neat for, I, I don't know, maybe I made up a parable for you guys. I'm not Jesus, and I'm not near as intelligent or wise or amazing as Jesus was, but I think we need to sometimes have parables that hit with our current context to understand what's going on here. And so we can understand what it means to have the Beatitudes and to receive the goodness of the transformative nature of Jesus as we come into life. So here's a parable for you. I want you to imagine that you are with a group of your friends and that you've been hanging out. Now, I know because of the virus, this is kind of hard to imagine, but just imagine before the virus came, before we've had all this quarantine going on, that you were hanging out with a group of your friends, and you guys all started talking, and you got together, and you were talking about something that you really like and that you wanted to go do. You know, let's use the virus in order to help us with this parable. Maybe it was they were talking about your favorite restaurant, I know a lot of you guys have been going out and getting curbside, and if you're like me and like Mexican food, curbside just does not work. The food is still good, but you do not get unlimited chips and dip. It's really, you're really missing out. I'm missing being able to go to the restaurants. And your friends have been talking about going to your favorite restaurant. And so they talk, start talking about your restaurant, and they're just really talking about it, and you're there in their midst, and everything's going really good and really well, and you're getting really excited about this because it seems like they're wanting to celebrate you and go do something that you want to do because they said, hey, what's your favorite restaurant? And so you shared it with them, and they said, all right, let's go. Let's get in the car and go. And so as they're talking about going, they start talking about where everybody's going to sit. Your, your best friend says, all right, well, I'll go ahead and sit in the passenger seat. And then your, other fr your best friend says to the other friends, well, here's where you'll sit in the car, and here's where you'll sit, and here's where you'll sit. And they never say where you're going to sit. They talk about all your other friends going to the restaurant, but they don't talk about you going. And then they say, and Jesus is coming, and he's going to drive. And they all say, all right, let's go. And they don't say, all right, and say your name. Let's go. And you're beginning to wonder, what's going on? Are you included? I mean, this is your favorite restaurant. They were talking about your favorite place. Are you included in this? And they all start getting ready to go. And they all get out and they load up in the car. And nobody really says, hey, sit next to me as they get up in the car. Jesus ends up getting out of the car, out of the driver's seat and comes over to you, invites you, and says, come on, we're going to your favorite restaurant. I want you to get in and join me. I want you to come and experience this goodness. <laughs> he may even quote a psalm, taste and, good, taste and see how good God is. Come on, let's go to this restaurant. Let's go and enjoy it. You thought your friends had forgotten you. You thought you weren't worth it. You thought you weren't going to be able to go on this trip and to be able to join them, and yet Jesus still invites you and still says, it's time for you to come and taste and see how good God is. When we get into the parable of the Good Samaritan, we need to remember what's going on here politically, economically, socially, what's going on in this parable. We can learn about it by reading John chapter 4 and watching Jesus' experience with the woman at the well. Jesus is in Samaria, and he goes to a well at noon in the middle of the day, and a woman comes to draw water, and he asks for her to give him some water. And her first response is, it says everything about the Jewish economic, social, just racial problems that are going on between Samaria and, and Jews during that time. The woman speaks up and says, are you speaking to me, sir? I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman. She's essentially saying to Jesus, bringing up this truth, that I recognize that you're a Jew and you Jews normally don't invite us into anything. And Jesus says, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, you would ask him to invite you to get you a drink of water because I have water where you'll never go thirsty. 
we find out that the Samaritans are a people that are wanting to be spiritually strong, but they feel spiritually poor. The woman says, you Jews say that you should worship, we should worship on Mount Zion where the temple is in Jerusalem, but we, our fathers say we should worship on this hill. What should it be? And Jesus says, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. And Jesus opens up her eyes to this truth that the gospel, the invitation, is for everyone, especially those who feel that they're spiritually poor and especially those who think that they're spiritually rich and they're missing out on what the gospel is really all about. So let's get back into Luke chapter 10. Get back into this idea, this parable of thinking that sometimes our friends forget to invite us and sometimes they purposely forget to invite us. That's an oxymoron, but it works out because <laughs> that's what they'll end up saying when you're like, hey, why didn't you invite me? Oh, we forgot. Because sometimes we end up being the poor and we need to be reminded and sometimes we're the spiritually rich and we forget to invite other people and we need to be reminded that Jesus is the one who's driving. Jesus is the one whose car we're in. Jesus is the one who's leading us on this journey and it has invited all of us into this. And we need to remember that as we talk about going to our favorite place which is heaven. So watch what happens here. Jesus just got done talking to his disciples, the 72 who have come back, who've been casting out demons, and he said, blessed are those who see, let's rejoice for your name is written in heaven. And then he says, blessed are they that see the things that other people were wanting to see and those that actually listen in here. And then we get into verse number 25, and it begins the parable of the Good Samaritan. As Jesus was talking to his disciples and telling them, blessed are those who have eyes and that see, and blessed are those who have ears and hear, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. So from the context, what I think is going on here, and as we, as we think about the story and what Jesus is doing, it seems like Jesus has gone over to his disciples and said, hey guys, guess what? Here is what the kingdom is really all about. Listen, it's about really seeing. It's about really seeking first the kingdom of heaven. It's about trusting in the transformative truth of who I am. And this lawyer watching him, speaking to his disciples kind of quietly to the side, goes over there and starts to try to pick a fight, starts to try to prod him. And he says, teacher, what shall I do to enter in, or to inherit eternal life? Or we could rephrase that in the terminology that Jesus has been using. What should I do to have my name written in heaven? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered Jesus, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, okay, what's written in the law? How would you imagine or how do you understand what it takes to inherit eternal life? And the lawyer immediately quotes the Shema, quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which begins with, Hear, O Israel, hear, O those that struggle with God and want relationship with God. The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God. And he begins quoting at that point of it. And then he adds on to it something that the rabbis added on into the Shema, which is what really all the law is all about, even the Ten Commandments. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this? <laughs> I find this really interesting. The guy asks him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to have my name written in heaven? And Jesus says, you've answered right. Do these things, love God and love your neighbor, and you will live. I find it really interesting and powerful that when Jesus teaches, when Jesus shares things with people, when they say something, he teaches so simply but so profoundly and deeply that he can say so much more by saying so much less. Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Do these things and you'll live. Eternal life, inheriting eternal life is about living, is about having life. And what's interesting is when Jesus says you will live, it's present, continuous future. It's now. It's for always. It's eternal. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself to Jesus, <laughs> it's funny, he got the answer right that Jesus asked. <laughs> 
but now he's wanting to continue on because he's still struggling with who Jesus is and the transformative nature of the kingdom of heaven. He still thinks he's spiritually rich. The lawyer who thinks he's spiritually rich, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied by telling him a parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, for us to understand the beginning of this parable in the store, we have to understand that the road to Jericho was a pretty popular road to take from Jerusalem. Jericho was the place where all the priests and Levites decided to live because it was a beautiful town. It was a beautiful place to live. And the road to Jericho was beautiful. It, was, it had palm trees all the way down it. it was, you were able to go on a hike through the mountains, and it wasn't super rough. It wasn't super steep. It was a very nice road to be able to take. And it was well-traveled. Now, it wasn't backed up bumper to bumper like some of our roads are. It was just a nice road to go out and take a drive on, to go out and experience God's creation and God's nature. And this is where the rich in spirit have decided to live was in Jericho. Those that worked in the temple, those that were close to God's glory, the place where heaven and earth came together. This is where the priests and the Levites had decided to make their home. This is where the spiritually rich were, was Jericho. And this man, we have no idea who he was. Jesus is telling the story, and he doesn't give us any information. So apparently, it's not important who he is. It's not important that he's rich. It's not important if he's poor. It's not important if he's Jewish or Gentile or Samaritan. It's not important to Jesus. We just know that this man was walking down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he happened to fall among some robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So apparently there weren't a lot of travelers on the section of the road while the man was there and some robbers decided to take advantage of this. And so they take the man who's been going from Jerusalem, the place where the temple is, where God's glory dwells, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they find him, and they beat him, they rob him, and they strip him, and they leave him for dead there on the side of the road. Jesus is telling us a story. Verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when the priest saw the man on the side of the road, he passed by the other side. <laughs> when Jesus says by chance there, the lawyer that's asking these questions about who is my neighbor immediately went, whoa, ho, ho. I already know there's going to be priests walking down that road. That's the place where they live. They go from Jerusalem to Jericho in order to go to and from work. This is their daily commute. Of course there's going to be a priest there. But Jesus ends up doing something that's interesting. He doesn't tell us which way the priest is going. He doesn't tell us that the priest has come from Jericho to Jerusalem or going from Jerusalem to Jericho. All he says is that this priest, this spiritually rich man, I guess today we could equate him to, I don't know, a minister was walking down the road and he sees this man who's laying on the side naked and bleeding and robbed. And so what the priest decides to do is make sure to walk around the man to go the other way. Now the lawyer's probably thinking, well, that's probably wise of him. He's got to make sure that he stays clean for worship. He can't get his tie and his shirt dirty. He can't, he can't get his hands unclean because he won't be able to work in the temple if he's doing that. So he probably, the lawyer probably imagined that the priest was going to Jerusalem in order to work at the temple. But Jesus says that he goes off and leaves the man laying there. And we can think so much. Jesus is so good at telling parables in order to get us to understand what reality is really all about. We could think so much about why the priest would go around and do that. And more than likely, what the lawyer's thinking at this moment is that the priest did a good job of keeping himself ceremonially, spiritually clean that he can be able to do his work. The priest sees the man laying on the side of the road and he decides to walk on the other side so he doesn't even get close to him and go, go on his way. Verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, a member of the tribe of Moses and Aaron, a member of one of the guys that would work in the temple to be able to help bake the bread, to be able to help, uh, help the priests out in their job, to be able to help clean, to do all that kind of stuff. A Levite, another spiritual elite, was walking down the road. 
He may have been coming from Jericho to Jerusalem to work, or he may have been going home from work, but he was on this road. And when he came to the place and saw that the man was there, he too passed on the other side of the road and left the man for dead, left him naked and bleeding, so that way he would stay spiritually clean to be able to do his work as a Levite. And then Jesus changes the story up a little bit. And then he says, but a Samaritan. <laughs> Immediately as this lawyer is listening to this, and I wonder as his disciples are sitting around and wondering what Jesus is doing with this parable, and Jesus just got done saying, the kingdom of heaven is about those who open up their eyes and see, those who listen and hear and do, who have their names written in heaven. I, begin, I wonder what they're going thinking as they hear, but a Samaritan. <laughs> they're going to go, oh no, where's Jesus going with this? Because the Jewish people didn't really like the Samaritans. The Samaritans were not allowed to go past the court of the Gentiles into the temple. They, if they went to the temple to be spiritually closer to God, they couldn't get as spiritually closer to God as a priest and a Levite could. But a Samaritan was walking down the road. We don't know if he's going to the temple or if he's leaving the temple. All we know is he's walking down the road to Jer of Jericho and he sees a man who's been robbed beaten, stripped naked, and left for dead on the side of the road. As he journeyed, he came to where the man was, and when he saw the man, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bound his wounds, touching him, washing the blood off, taking care of him, and becoming ceremonially unclean according to the Levitical law. But a Samaritan, a spiritually poor person, saw him and had compassion for him, bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set the man on his own donkey, on his own animal, and brought him to an inn to take care of him. And the next day, the man, the Samaritan, took out two denarii, took out two days of wage, took out $400 or something like that. And gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of this man, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So Jesus' story ends there with a Samaritan taking care of the man, wrapping his body up, cleaning it from the wounds, giving him resources and financial ability to be able to live, to be able to eat, to be able to have a room. He takes care of him. Look what Jesus does. He looks at the lawyer and says, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Now the lawyer who got this lesson, who got this story because he said, but who is my neighbor? He was asking a question that was saying, hey, who do I really need to look out for? Who do I really need to seek? Jesus says, instead, who was the one who actually looked out for his neighbor? Who was the one who did that? And the lawyer looks at Jesus and says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus does something here that's so incredible and so amazing that sometimes we fail to see what's going on. What he does is he, in story form, shares the truth that the kingdom of heaven is for all. Normally, we would think as we go through the story that the spiritually poor person was the man who was robbed, who was left bleeding on the side of the road, half dead, who had nothing, not even the clothes on his back any longer. And we'd go, that's the spiritually poor person. But then you continue to read, and Jesus brings a supposedly more spiritually poor person into the story while the spiritually rich ones have been going their own way. And what Jesus does here to a spiritually rich lawyer, a teacher of the law, somebody that's been going through the Torah, going through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and teaching it most of his life, he, and when he asks, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus says, here's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's that healing and compassion and cleansing will come for those that need it. And those that feel like they don't have it are invited into this. And those that thought that they did have it have already had the ability to do this. The priest and the Levite could have stopped and taken care of him, but they chose not to. So here's what you need to do. Show mercy. 
Open up your eyes and your ears to where the kingdom of heaven is and where God is calling us to go and what he's calling us to do. What he's calling us for is to be blessed, is to be world transformers, is to be people that trust in the invitation of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, where blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers, <laughs> for they will be given, they'll be given peace. They'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, you all have been invited Don't miss the invitation. See, when your friends were sitting around talking about your favorite restaurant, talking about going there, they probably just thought you were going to go. They probably thought you knew you were included. They probably thought that you knew it was about you and that you didn't, they didn't have to tell you where to sit. That's often what we do in this world when we go out into the world and we fail to share the good news with other people. We think that other people know that they're invited. And what Jesus does on the Sermon on the Mount as he begins with the Beatitudes is he opens up and gets out of the car, as my parable said, and goes up to you and says, guess what? Even though you may have thought that you are invited and others have been invited, I want you to know that you are invited that you're invited to show mercy. You're invited to live into the kingdom. You're invited to live into the law in a better way than you were ever able to do before I brought you this invitation. Jesus invites you to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's what the Beatitudes are about. It's an invitation to a transformed life, Regardless where you're at, regardless how spiritually strong or spiritually weak you think you are, Jesus says, I can make you spiritually better than you thought you were. I've invited you to love your neighbor and love your God better than you've been able to because I'm here, I am with you. So the whole Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, or you could say Luke chapter 6 through, I don't know, it's like chapter 11 or 12 where he finally ends the Sermon on the Mount uh, dialogue that goes on there in Luke we finally get this understanding that we can truly live in to God's hope, his plan, his righteousness for us now because you've been invited. Are you willing to accept this invitation? Are you willing to join into this invitation that, that Jesus believes that you can? That he believes that no matter if it looks like you're going to be ceremonially unclean, he's invited you into a world where peace and mercy and joy exist? His own brother, James, didn't get it when he was here on earth until he rose again. And James writes this amazing book that you can find at the end of the New Testament that where he shares that, oh man, we needed to listen, we needed to see, and we weren't listening very well, but I'm glad I finally heard it. Look what he says in James chapter 1, verse 22. James says, do not merely listen to the word. Don't be like lawyers who can answer the questions but don't actually live into the answers. And so deceive yourself. Do what the word says. I find it so amazing that John opens his gospel by calling Jesus the word. We've been called to do what Jesus says. We've been called to live for Jesus and to be transformed by his invitation, his transformative call, the Beatitudes, to truly inherit the kingdom of heaven and have our names written in heaven. It's not about the reward. It's about the life that we can have now that he gives to us. Because the reward's just included. (laughs) The reward is just what we get, what we receive. We get to be with God. And when we accept his invitation, that's what we're doing. When we listen to his word and be doers of his word and listen and show mercy to our neighbors and love our Lord, our God, with everything that we are, we become hearers of the word And we live into the sermon that Jesus preaches up on the side of a mountain where everybody from the area comes and joins. And he says, guess what, everybody? Male and female, poor in spirit and strong in spirit, you're invited. You're invited to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And guess what? All these things will be added to you. You will have life. So, Have you received the invitation? Have you accepted it? You've received it. Have you accepted it? Jesus is inviting you to live. 
He's inviting you to be transformed from the anxiety, the stress, the junk of the world that has been messing with you for so long. He's invited you to be transformed and to live into a better calling, to live as the creation of God that you were created to be. Accept his invitation. Get into the car and go to your favorite place because that's what heaven is. Heaven is a place where there's no longer any sin, where there's no more weeping because God will wipe away all the tears. It's a place where Jesus makes all things new. It's a place where he invites you to live now with hope that he's coming again. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And I pray the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Accept his invitation and notice that he's there for you. God bless you. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body. That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Our Father in heaven, as we close today, we want to just thank you for being the God that you are, the God of love, who saves us from ourselves, saves us from our sins, and invites us into your life, your eternal life. And I pray that you will be with us as we go on our daily days, as we go on our days today and every day, with the mindset of we are truly living in eternal life now and help us to continue to allow Jesus to take over each compartment of our lives to truly live into that. We trust you. We believe it is true that we can become like him. We just pray that you would help us when we struggle or or at times when we don't believe that. Father, we ask also that you would just be with each of our members as they're in their homes today. We pray that you will give them peace. We pray that you will give them comfort. And we pray that you will give them hope. We look forward to the time where we can come together and be as one as we should be. And we ask that you'd be with us until that time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great mind. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In him we live. In him we live. And we survive. And we survive from dust our God. From dust our God. Created man. Created man. He is our God. He is our God. The great I am. The great I am. There was a long, long time ago. A God whose voice the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In him we live. In him we live. And we survive. And we survive from dust our God. From dust our God. Created man. Created man. He is our God. He is our God. The great I am. The great I am. Secure is life from mortal mind. God holds the germ within his hand. 
Though men may search, they cannot find, for God alone does understand. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In Him we live. In Him we live. And we survive. And we survive from dust our God. From dust our God. Created man. Created man. He is our God. He is our God. The great I am. The great I am. Our God who sun upon a tree. In life was willing there to give That he from sin might set men free And evermore with him could live There is a God There is a God He is alive He is alive In him we live In him we live And we survive And we survive From dust our God From dust our God Created man Created man He is our God week.